tradition of Northern Studies at Trent really goes back to the founding of the university. Um, our first and founding president, Tom Simons, encouraged the study of Northern interests and encouraged people, particularly from the geography department and the history department, including the late W.L. Morton, to promote the establishment of an association of Canadian universities for Northern Studies. And since that time, Northern research has played an important part in the university at both the undergraduate and graduate levels, ranging from geographers who are studying ice to cultural studies people who are studying images of the North. Um, the research looks at the science, the people, the environment, the land, and the history of the North. One key element of this long tradition of Northern research has been the Northern Studies Lecture which um, has had a list of very uh, prestigious and um, impressive speakers coming. It was inaugurated in 1985 with Justice Thomas Berger as the first speaker, and it continued on inviting scientists, academics, activists, and uh, Indigenous leaders like Mary Simon to come and speak at Trent. <clears throat> and we continue with that tradition tonight. The series is sponsored by the Frost Centre for Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies and the Roberta Bondar uh, Fellowship in Northern Studies. So I want to uh, welcome you and I want to ask Professor Finus Dunaway, who is a member of the Frost Centre and also the Director of the Graduate Program in History, to come up and introduce our speaker tonight, Carol Kane. <coughs> Thanks, Joan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Carol Payne is an Associate Professor of Art History at Carleton University, and she's someone who has uh, a lot of other uh, interesting uh, stories and backgrounds and experiences to offer, to bring to bear on this kind of topic. Uh, her undergraduate studies were as a fine arts major, and she says she took a circuitous, circuitous route into academia, uh, moving into curatorial work uh, at the Canadian uh, Museum of Timber Photography, doing projects for the J. Paul Getty Museum in California and the London Regional Art Gallery. Um, she brings the skills and training of an art historian, which is what her PhD is in, to the study of photography, uh, close analysis of images, really respecting the materiality of the image, how it works as a visual text. But she also considers how these photographs work as a form of social practice, moving beyond the frames of the image to contain the image to see how it does its work in society and culture. How photographs can be put to different uses by different groups at different points in time. So for her, the image is not something that's static or inert, but something that's active, that something that has rhetorical agency and figures into much larger profound struggles over culture, power, and identity. I think this comes through uh, in all of her scholarship. Her publications include a co-edited book titled The Cultural Work of Photography in Canada, and the recently published book, which I think we may have some copies of here, uh, titled The Official Picture, The National Film Board of Canada's Still Photography Division and the Image of Canada, 1941 to 1971. Um, for those of you here, here last week, uh, hearing Peter Raymond's talk about the National Film Board uh, and issues of indigenous filmmaking in the North, uh, I think Carol's work offers a completely different perspective and it gives us uh, the often uh, un unstudied history of photography as part of the National Film Board project. Moreover, uh, what she's been doing of late is trying to understand how photographs can take on new meanings today, particularly when they are repatriated uh, in indigenous communities. Um, I had the great pleasure of teaching one of her articles just last week in one of my courses. And uh, it was a course where we were looking at histories of colonialism and visual culture in a lot of different historical and cultural contexts. And uh, repeatedly throughout the class, students would come back to her article and uh, show how it really challenged some of the assumptions that underwrote uh, some of the other studies of visual culture and colonialism. Uh, it, was, it was remarkable to see how often uh, her insights they were able to, to use to critique uh, some of the other scholars we were looking at. Uh, she'll be talking, I think, tonight about some of her current work, which is on uh, views from the north. And this is a collaborative research project that involves an Ottawa-based Inuit training program, as well as Libraries and Archives Canada. This builds on the well-known work of Project Naming, again, a visual repatriation of returning uh, images to Indigenous communities. 
But she's also trying uh, to engage these communities in different ways uh, than, than just naming the individuals in the photographs. And this is done by Inuit youth conducting interviews, doing oral histories with elders to gather stories and memories and recollections uh, that they, they can draw out of the image itself. Uh, really, again, an example of putting photography to work uh, in, in different cultural contexts. Uh, this will be the subject for talk tonight, Views from the North, Photographs, Generations, and Inuit Cultural Memory. Please join me in welcoming Carol Payne. Thank you very much uh, for the lovely introduction. I, I think what I might do is turn down some lights at the front. Are, are they here? Are they here? Um, probably uh, that makes the screen a bit brighter. Good. Um, and I want to thank you for the introduction, and I want to thank Joan Sangster for uh, coordinating the talk and giving me the opportunity to speak at the North at uh, Trent Lecture Series. Um, this long-standing series, as you probably know, creates an important occasion for the exchange of information and ideas about the North, and I feel very privileged to have been asked to participate. And I also particularly want to thank uh, Joan and also Kathy Scholl uh, for selecting this image for the poster. Um, it's not very often that you're asked to speak and the organizers pick an image so, that so succinctly announces the topic of the talk and crystallizes some of its key arguments. So this image, figure out how to do this, there we go, uh, is a 1956 photograph and it illustrates how the camera um, has provided what Mary Louise Pratt familiarly terms a contact zone between Inuit and Kualnat or Southerners. Encapsulated in this image is both the photographic gaze as a tool of settler colonial power and the capacity to shoot back to use the camera and photographic images to reclaim Inuit agency, paradoxically through a key tool of Southern technology. In what follows tonight in my talk, I'm going to discuss the camera as a settler colonial tool, but I'll devote most of the lecture to how that gaze is being returned by Inuit communities through the camera and through intergenerational dialogue and a reframing of historic archival images like this 1956 example. In discussing that return of the gaze, I'll re introduce a research project that I've been in uh, involved in for the past several years. I want you to remember this archival photograph. I'll return to it later in the night. But right now, I want to move from 1956 to the 20 teens and introduce you to a couple of people. Um, and we're going to meet uh, these two people in January 2012, um, the people you see on the screen are Inuit student named Katrina Hatogina and the elder Bernadette Elgok. The two of them sat down in Bernadette's residence in Kugluktuk, both women's home community, in Nunavut's western region of Kitikmiut. Bernadette is the grandmother of Katrina's best friend, and as Katrina told me afterwards, I'm like at her place every day. <laughs> Between these two women sat a pile of photographs like these ones, depicting the community of Kugluktuk mainly during the 1950s and 60s. The photographs picture various people and sites around Kugluktuk, young Inuit women uh, posing with fox fur, a camp on the land, and community members posing for the camera or greeting a biplane. Many of the people in these photographs had not been identified at the time, and for Katrina and Bernadette, that must have lent their encounter an air of rediscovery. For more than an hour, including 30 minutes on tape, these two women poured over that album, Bernadette offering identifications and recollections prompted by the images, while Katrina posed one or two questions, but mainly listened. The photographic prints guided them without constraining the conversation. They talked of Kugluktuk's history, they shared information, they gossiped. Nothing, it seems, could be homier than that conversation over a photo album between two women, one elderly, one still in her teens, bound together by culture and community. 
And I would imagine, as I look around this room, that most of us have participated in conversations like that one. Um, perhaps with an elderly relative or a young child interested in your past. Their conversations typically couched in a sense of nostalgia or maybe even a sense of familial duty. And they demonstrate, as both Martha Langford and Elizabeth Edwards have shown through very different scholarly perspectives, that orality is a crucial component of the photographic experience, as it is, I might say, in Inuit culture, of course, in general. But in this lecture tonight, as in the project I'm going to describe to you as a whole, I'm going to argue that that cozy, familiar conversation I've just described, a discussion that revolved around photographs, place, culture, and memory, was also a moment in which the practice of historical representation was reimagined from an Inuit subject position, and in turn, that that indigenization of historical memory was a political act. For Inuit and Nunavut, as in other regions of the North, the act of memory is indeed political. It's become a key strategy for reaffirming cultural identity as well as reclaiming and reshaping Western and Southern historical narratives about their culture and about their communities. In so doing, memory work augments ongoing struggles towards self-governance, land claims, language retention, and the repatriation of indigenous material culture while also reasserting cultural bonds and knowledge. Yet indigenous memory work, like the photo-based project that Katrina um, and Bernadette participated in, also speaks to the complexity of exchange, temporal, generational, and cultural. Here, not only do these images reach across generations of the Inuit, but they also form a contact zone between Inuit and non-Inuit communities, and between the North and the South. In fact, the images that prompted that intimate conversation about family, community members, and Inuit culture were ironically photographed by outsiders and are now housed in Ottawa, thousands of kilometers from Kugluktuk. The photographs that Katrina and Bernadette leafed through depicted Kugluktuk when it was still known officially as Copper Mine. The promotional images of women sporting Arctic fur Fox, Arctic fox fur, excuse me, showed copper mine as the center of the fur trade. But neither Katrina nor Bernadette had seen these photographs before. They became acquainted with them through the work of southern researchers like me and institutions who supplied the images, recording equipment, and instructions in oral history. And in turn, these images, along with Bernadette's and Katrina's and the other participants' perspectives, continue to link individuals and communities through the web. Um, in short, the photo-based interview that Katrina Hatugina conducted with her elder Bernadette Elgok was at once a community-oriented discussion of Inuit culture, part of a trans-Inuit exchange, and an intercultural network. In this paper, I'm going to introduce that project, which is known as Views from the North, and it's the project that Bernadette and Katrina participated in, as well as dozens of other Inuit youth and elders since 2005. Views from the North is a collaboration of Carleton University, Library and Archives Canada, and the Ottawa-based Inuit training program Nunavut Sivanaksavut, a school that Katrina attended during the 2011-2012 academic year. And I think it's best to start this conversation looking at Nunavut Sivanaksavut. This school is housed in a former bank on Rideau Street, uh, right near the Rideau Center in uh, downtown Ottawa. And it's a lively place and center of activity among Ottawa's large Inuit community. Open areas in the classrooms are filled with the sound of drumming, hip hop, throat singing, electronics, and concentrated discussions about Inuit culture. Nunavut Sivunaksavut as a school was founded in 1985, initially to prepare Inuit youth to participate in land claims negotiations that would result in the establishment of Nunavut in 1999. Ottawa, as the seat of federal government and the largest Inuit population in the South, was a logical venue for training students to negotiate for Inuit culture with the federal government. 
Students in the first few years of the program were in their later 20s and many became involved in the development of Nunavut. Um, today, however, Ennis is a much more youthful environment with most students in their late teens or early 20s um, coming to Ottawa for the program from the 26 dispersed communities in Nunavut. The majority of those students stay for eight months, some as long as two years. If Nunavut Sivanuksavut was founded with a goal of political advocacy, today it's guided in part by a mission to redress grave situations facing Inuit youth. Recently, uh, Nunavut Sivanuksavut founding faculty members Murray Angus and Morley Hansen described the, quote, depth of insecurity that many youth feel about their identity, having to negotiate two worlds at home. They've often found themselves forsaking Inuitic language and traditional skill development as they follow the school system for its prospect of employment and a better life at the end. They often doubt their own ability to live up to the image of what it means to be a real Inuk and find themselves even questioning the value of trying to do so. Caught between those two images and developing proficiency in neither, they are at risk of becoming marginalized of becoming spectators in a world played out before them, end quote. And that's from the founders of uh, the school with which I work. That sense of marginalization, of course, takes very grave forms, as probably everyone knows here. Um, among Inuit men in their teens and 20s, um, they have roughly 10 times the chance of committing suicide as the rest of the population in Canada. To aid students caught between those two value systems, this school offers them a supportive educational environment that innovatively blends traditional Inuit knowledge with practical life skills and academics. So students take courses in Inuktitut language, Inuit history, they learn about land claims, they learn um, various negotiations. And importantly, a number of elders come to teach them. So leaders like Mary Simon, uh, have come to visit regularly, um, and there are instructions in things like drumming and sewing by elders who visit from the north or in the community in Ottawa already. It's that school's emphasis on traditional knowledge that makes Nunavut Savunuksavut a distinctive institution and its pedagogical approach particularly innovative. And it's become a real success story with many of the students. After about eight months at the school discussing land claims agreements, meeting Inuit elders, refining Inuitic language skills, and learning Inuit legends, songs, and history, student Kathleen Merritt of Rankin Inlet told me in 2009 that the school, quote, opened me up to want to uh, take part in my culture. I guess for 20 years of my life, I can't say that I embraced my own culture or that I cared one way day just to stop and talk to an elder um, because I didn't speak in Nutitook. So for 20 years of my life before coming to the school and realizing the things that in Inuit did, I didn't really care about that stuff." End quote. Another student, Kevin Iksiktaryuk of Baker Lake, um, told me after being at uh, Nunavut Sivunuksavut, he had, quote, come to appreciate Inuit culture so much more, like I'm proud to be Inuk now. I'm proud to be able to say I'm Inuk, end quote. In stressing Inuit traditions, um, the school and knowledge passed down by elders, Nunavut Savunak Savut focuses on Inuit Kayi Maya Tukangyat, or as it's much more familiarly known, IQ, a playful indigenization of intelligence quotient. IQ is defined broadly as Inuit traditional knowledge. The scholars Frederick Legrand and Yarek Ustin stress that IQ is not something abstract or separated from the context in which it's produced. It's always related to the present and always being updated. Um, the concepts that are key to this, uh, the policies of IQ, including consensus decision making, collaborative relationships, uh, the concept of uh, environmental steward, ship and so forth are also central to that education. Um, increasingly, those IQ values, which place an emphasis on those uh, values, especially collaborations, 
have come to define for many people what it really means to be Inuit today. And yet at this school, as in other places, um, those values are often being promoted and implemented with the use of distinctly Western or Southern technologies like the photograph and the web. In 2001, for example, uh, the school Nunavut Suvunuk Suvut started partnering with Library and Archives Canada on project naming. And for that initiative, Nunavut Suvunuk Suvut students reached, uh, researched photographs of Inuit in the archives and interviewed elders, asking them to identify people they were depicted in the archives. Subsequently, those identifications have been done largely online through Project Naming's extensive website. That site, which has so far survived cuts at Library and Archives Canada, fortunately, allows visitors to search hundreds of archival photographs and submit identifications. The project reaches out to uh, Inuit across the north through other networks, including a feature that regularly runs in the journal the Nunatsiak News. Uh, uh, feature called Do You Know Your Elders? And to date, project naming has been successful in identifying hundreds of Inuit in its collection and connecting generations of Inuit across the North and beyond. Views from the North, the project that I've been involved in and that Katrina Hatogina and Bernadette Elgok participated in a couple of years ago, was initiated in 2005 as an extension of project naming, with which it will also be linked. It's intended to complement the pedagogy at Nunavut Savanaksavut and to broaden project naming's emphasis on identifications to now include photo-based oral history interviews. In that way, the project reflects the primacy of oral tradition within Inuit culture, while in very practical terms, allowing a more extensive, personal, and less structured flow of information to be handed down. Interviews and archival photographs, as well as spoken and photographic responses, are now available on an interactive website, a favorite technology among Inuit groups to communicate among the dispersed communities in the North. The methodology that uh, informs this project is called pro visual repatriation. This is a concept coined by the anthropologist Anne Finnip Riordan. Visual repatriation is the recovery and recontextualization of visual materials by the same Aboriginal groups they depict or in collaboration with them. In the work of Aboriginal artists, writers, and curators like Jeff Thomas, Julia Sinagini, and anthropologists like Elizabeth Edwards, Rosalind Poignant, Alison Brown, and Laura Pierce, and Heidi Geismer, among others, Visual repatriation principles have been applied to the recoding and reclamation of Western or non-Indigenous photographic representations. However, the use of photographs in this project differs from repatri repatriated uh, material culture. Typically, when we think of repatriation, there's a full reclamation to communities. Visual repatriation uses archives and uh, web-based materials so that, in effect, uh, materials are kept in a southern source. As such, I often call this project now photo-based oral history, leaving repatriation aside since there isn't a full reclaiming, but there are materials that circulate among all those sources at the same time. At the same time, this is a project that takes oral history very seriously, and uh, especially the advances made among Inuit communities in protecting the Inuitutuk language and in talking about uh, legends and stories and passing down of material, and also the important work that anthropologists like Beatrice Poulignon and Michel Therrien have carried out. Um, and uh, figures like Jacques-Louis Doré, uh, John Bennett and Susan Rowley. According to Collignon and Therrien, um, quote, the Inuit claim that the reach of our tongue, the spread of our language, determines our homeland. So in that very statement, the idea that uh, speaking in an oral tradition uh, is part of a culture, is part of an understanding of homeland, is uh, very central to that work. Um, 
the project also thinks very much about memory studies and draws on um, not just uh, the work of Western memory study scholars, uh, but work that's been done in, in um, truth and reconciliation commissions to use memory as an alternative to conventional notions of history. For the project, in practical terms, Nunavut Sivunaksavut students are hired as researchers to interview elders, each in his or her own home community, about photographs depicting that same community decades ago, mainly from the 1950s and 60s. They typically approach a grandparent, another relative, or a neighbor, and in turn that elder is paid for his or her time. These small clusters of elders and youth sit down, usually in the elder's home, over a cup of tea and the photo album. Reflecting Elizabeth Edwards' discussion of affect and the photographic object, students bring actual prints of photographs rather than showing them on a computer screen although sometimes computers are used to record the interviews. Elders are encouraged to keep any photographic prints they want, and they handle the photographs literally pointing to familiar faces and caressing their likenesses. As Edwards has shown, the material properties of the print enhance affective engagement, and that's certainly been true in this project where elders enthusiastically handle and take the photographs and talk about them uh, quite directly. In the project, the elders have identified many individuals and locations in the photographs. And in doing so, they've enhanced community knowledge and Inuit cultural knowledge. I'll give you some examples. A year ago, Elder Anne Hansen in Iqaluit identified family members in this photograph on the right. And I'm showing you on the left, Anne Hansen, who's quite an esteemed elder in Iqaluit. Um, sitting down with um, three young people. This is in January 2013. Um, uh, looking at uh, photographs, including the one on the right. Um, and uh, in another uh, gathering, um, uh, just a few weeks ago, um, in Clyde River, a student named Leanne Hanu interviewed five elders, and she approached a whole bunch of people, but in one of the photographs she found her own father as a young boy among the images, an image she had not seen before uh, and held on to with great pride. Um, another student also identified her uh, grandfather. So this image uh, was the subject of a gathering in 2006 in Chesterfield Inlet that a young student named Rebecca Samartuk organized, and she organized the whole community to gather and look at photographs together. Um, they noticed her grandfather, Victor Samartok, uh, in this image from 1968 carving. And finally, the image that I opened the lecture with today, uh, with Bernadette Elgak, the elder in Kogluktuk, well, Bernadette identified herself as this beautiful young woman wearing fox fur. In all of these cases, they were not images people had seen, and the identifications were emotional connections. But naming names is only part of what happens in all those interviews. The photographs launch the conversations, which then travel on to family stories, community anecdotes, and other forms of knowledge. A year ago, um, in uh, Greece Fjord, Arkna Adulak, and Pauline Akiagok spoke with Arkna's father and aunt, and you see they took some photographs of uh, while they were interviewing them. Um, and they spoke to them about their experiences of being among the communities relocated um, during the years of the photographs. And uh, recently, um, Terry Milton interviewed uh, various family members, including um, his grandfather, uh, Joshua Katsak and another grandfather, Ike Milton, who aren't in this particular photograph, um, about uh, the hunter Joseph Idlu, whom I think you heard about last week, uh, the subject of the documentary Between Two Worlds. And in 2009, a young student named Natasha Mablik, she's the young woman holding the uh, Barack Obama drum in front of the parliament. Um, Natasha Mablik of Pond Inlet 
in northern Baffona Island, uh, learned how her parents met and about her family's involvement in the fur trade generations ago. Another student, uh, Jennifer Kellebuck of Ikalawit, interviewed her grandfather and did so only days before he passed away. She spoke with uh, a, a research assistant on the project, Gina Ellison, about how moving that interview was and, and how precious the recording was to the rest of the family. The conversations often depart from the explicit subjects of the photographs, yet the images play important roles in breaking the ice between generations, prompting memory and focusing the discussion. As Natasha Mablik, who's the young woman with the drum here, told me um, after she'd conducted interviews, she said, quote, they led to a lot of regular conversations that my father and I could have had, but we probably wouldn't have had without the photographs, end quote. The elders consistently relate the narratives they're relaying to the students sitting across the table from them, weaving their own young life into the fabric of family, community, and cultural narratives. But one question hangs in the air in all of these intergenerational conversations, a question that the students never explicitly ask, and yet one that remains present throughout the encounters, and that is, how does one become an Inuk? Caught between those two worlds, like the title of the film Peter talked about last week, the students all but yearn for a clear sense of cultural identity, and the elders in turn answer that unspoken question with vivid, engaging discussions of so-called traditional Inuit life. Indeed, the portions of the interviews that turn to dog teaming, hunting skills, handcrafts, and legends are often the most animated parts of these intergenerational encounters. For the students who are increasingly immersed in IQ values through the school Nunavut Sivunaksavut and through those IQ policies developed by the government of Nunavut, those knowledges and skills are what a real Inuk possesses. According to the anthropologist Pamela Stevenson and others, Inuit cultural identity is increasingly being defined by an image of pre-contact life as codified by IQ values and policies. As I've noted elsewhere, in these uh, discussions and uh, in IQ in general, um, IQ functions as a form of strategic essentialism in which broad, sometimes even stereotypical cultural characteristics are embraced in an attempt to foster group cohesion while simultaneously critiquing the effect of essentializing stereotypes themselves. The images used in these interviews also seem to pose an unstated question, but rather than the active transformative becoming of the student's implied theory, the photographs all but demand something more contained, fixed, and confining. They seem to ask, very much in the past tense, what was an Inuk? The photographs at the center of these intergenerational encounters date mainly from the 1950s and 60s. They had been shot under the auspices of the federal Canadian government, mainly for the National Film Board of Canada's Still Photography Division. My own involvement in this project grew out of the research I've conducted for the book, The Official Picture, a cultural history of the NFB's involvement as a producer of still photographs and a discussion of its archive of a quarter of a million still photographs. The North is represented extensively in that archive by images like all of these. In fact, the image from the poster for uh, this year's uh, lecture series at Trent uh, is one of those images. It was shot in March 1956 by a man named Gar Lani, who was uh, one of two staff photographers for the NFB at the time. And it was shot in Resolute Bay, or as it is sometimes known now, Kwasuitik, um, uh, which is located, of course, on the southern coast of Cornwallis Island in Nunavut. Lunny was on assignment at the time following then Governor General Vincent Massey's tour of the North. The tour traveled to Baffin Island, visiting, among other communities, Frobisher Bay, now Iqaluit, Hall Beach, and Resolute Bay, 
where the image from the poster was shot. Massey's tour on the Eastern Arctic reflected the Canadian government's heightened economic, social, and political focus on the North in the 1950s. And the entourage included not only Gar Lunny and his camera, um, but an associated screen news cameraman. Publicizing this tour uh, through images was important to the Goodwill tour. The image in still photographs or motion pictures provided emblems of Canada and the federal government's specific efforts in the North. Many of those images reflect federal Canadian campaigns during the post-war period to promote assimilationist and economic policies in Arctic regions, and much more broadly, to employ the North as a loaded signifier of Canadian national identity. Lenny himself shot dozens of images on that tour, both in color and black and white, many featuring Massey and the Inuit that he met, or other images that were much more uh, of ethnographic uh, nature. But the image for the poster, I think, stands apart. It may well have been that Lunny framed it with a sense of irony and self-referentiality. It is, after all, a photograph of people making photographs. But I suspect that for viewers in the South, the intended audience of this and all NFB photographs from this tour, they would have thought that it was ironic to see Inuit with a modern tool like a camera. In fact, the image may remind you of that famous scene with a phonograph from Robert Flaherty's Nanook of the North. NFB photogra photographic images, of course, can be seen as part of a longer history of image making in the North in which the camera has been used as a tool of ethnographers, explorers, missionaries, filmmakers, and state authority in the North, often working within a salvage paradigm. Like those earlier representations, NFB photographs of the North racialize their Inuit subjects in ways that are both familiar to many colonialists and ethnographic representations, as well as in ways that are distinctive to the othering of the Inuit. These primitivizing images contributed to what Johannes Fabian has familiarly termed a denial of coevalness. They're, they fix their subtle, subjects temporally outside the modern as a contemporary sort of Stone Age peoples. Further, in reflecting racial stereotypes used specifically to describe the Inuit, at least since the 19-teens, the subjects of these images are often infantilized. Texts that accompany many NFB images frequently anchor the photographs to those racialized readings. Uh, in this photo story from the NFB, for example, a photo story that dates from 1955, um, it refers to the, quote, childlike and yet rugged simplicity of the Eskimo, end quote. My work on the NFB still division initially comprised an ideological critique of that photographic archive. Drawing on Foucauldian models, I saw this nationalist visual archive as a technology of power in which federal model of Canadian identity was disseminated and naturalized. But over time, I recognized, and I've written about this before, that there was a troubling paradox in such critiques, a paradox that more recently Christopher Morton and Edward, Elizabeth Edwards have commented on. And that is that while focusing attention so fully on critiquing state or colonialist authority and insisting that the photographic archive naturalizes its perceptions, such critiques deny the possibility of other readings. Despite their best intentions, they reinscribe authority. Collaborative photo-based memory work opens up the interpretive space of the image beyond that ideological critique. As I've written recently, students and elders use what Deborah Poole calls the visual economy of the NFB Still Photography Division Archive against the grain of its original intent and against that of my original uh, critiques of these images. Focusing on the excesses of the photographic image, that is the visual information that seeps into the image beyond the delimiting intents of photographers and commissioning authorities, students and elders see what had been invisible to me. 
where I witnessed visual evidence of racial stereotypes, subjugation, othering, and enforced cultural assimilation dressed up in those cheerful colors of jingoistic nationalism. They saw family members, long lost neighbors, hunting techniques, social gatherings, old friends. But that cultural disconnect over archival photographs paradoxically also forms a contact zone. And it's in part through their readings of images made by and facilitated through Southerners that youth and elder are, elders are cultivating a new sense of identity, a sense of what it means to be Inuk, one built on the fraught relationship with the South. At the same time, their interventions and the uncontainable excesses or contingencies of the photograph itself point to ways of opening up historical discourse beyond singular or narrow readings of a past. They urge us to think about the positions of telling, the telling of history and the coexistence of different narratives and perceptions of historical consciousness. And subsequently, through those photo-based encounters, the authority of the state photographic archive can be opened up to counter narratives of the image of the nation. And perhaps that returned gaze that occurs in these interviews, um, those assertions of Inuit agency through photographs, were always there already in the photographs, at least for those who could look at images like this one and see the returned gaze. Thank you very much. <laughs>